Good morning, everybody. My name is Adela Pineda. I am the director of the Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies at UT Austin. Um, today, um, we have uh, Paloma Diaz, our assistant uh, director of scholarly programs, and our guest, uh, Professor Malori Matsumoto, who is um, an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at UT Austin. And we are very, very happy to have her uh, with us, uh, very excited to present some of her work. Um, she is an archaeological and linguistic anthropologist whose research examines the interface between language, material culture, and religion in pre-colonial Maya communities of Mesoamerica across archaeology, epigraphy, ethnohistory, and historical anthropology. She has authored land, politics and memory in five Nijab Kiche titulos. And this is a careful analysis and translation of high, five Highland Maya titulos composed in the 16th century. The Spanish conquest of Highland Guatemala entailed a series of sweeping changes to indigenous society, not the least of which were the introduction of the Roman alphabet and the imposition of a European system of colonial government. Introducing the history of these documents and placing them within the context of colonial era Guatemala, this volume provides valuable information concerning colonial period orthographic practice, the Quiche language and language contact in Highland Guatemala. Professor Matsumoto has dozen scholarly articles and chapters on pre-Columbian archeology, span hieroglyphic writing, ethnohistory, colonial Highland Guatemala. And her work has been supported by the National Science Foundation, Fulbright, the Council on Library and Information Resources, Don Barton Oaks, and the John Carter Brown Library, among others. She received her PhD in anthropology from Brown University in 2021. Uh, so we, we lived in the same area uh, for, for quite a while, and now we are here together in Texas, in Austin, beautiful city. So thank you again, Professor Malori Matsumoto. I have to leave uh, you in good hands with Paloma, and thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Adela, for the for the very generous, uh, detailed introduction, and also for taking the time to introduce me in your busy schedule. I look forward to interacting more in hopefully in person in the future. Uh, and many thanks as well to Paloma Diaz uh, for working with Adela to organize this event. Um, it's wonderful joining the Lilas community here at UT, and they've been very welcoming. And I'm looking forward to getting more involved as we adjust back to in-person interaction. Great. OK, we'll see you later. Bye. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Oh, um, I need screen sharing uh, capabilities. Okay. Ah, OK, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, buenos dias, Katish. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And uh, again, I'd like to thank Lilas for not only welcoming to welcoming me into their community at UT Austin, but also for facilitating this presentation today. And I'll be speaking to you from the UT campus on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for, what, uh, for what's now called North America. And I'd especially like to acknowledge the Alabama Coshata, Caro, Carrizo, or Comecruo, Coahuiltecan, Comanche, Kickapoo, Lipanapachi, Tonkawa, and Isleta de Sur Pueblo, and all of the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or have become part of these lands and territories in Texas. So as Adela mentioned, my research focuses on the Maya area of Mesoamerica, which is probably very familiar to many of those watching this presentation. 
It comprises parts of southern and eastern Mexico, western Honduras, El Salvador, and then all of Guatemala and Belize. Uh, and this is just a map showing this area uh, with indicating many, but certainly not all of the pre-Columbian archeological sites in this region. My focus uh, in the presentation today will be on the classic period, which uh, scholars have defined as running from about 250 to 900 CE. This is a time of cultural fluorescence, of population growth, settlement expansion. Uh, and we also just have the most ample hieroglyphic and iconographic evidence from this time period, which are my primary sources of information for this particular talk. And when I say sort of the most ample evidence, I mean, in terms of quantity, we just have far more texts and images from this time period, but also in terms of geography, uh, we have evidence from a really wide range of the Maya region and from a lot of different settlements within that area. So since Maya archeology span really coalesced in the late 19th century, Scholars have used a series of common cultural traits to define classic Maya civilization. And these characteristics, which included religious practices, hieroglyphic writing, architecture, among other features, they were shared among populations that were not only distant in space and time, but also were never unified as a single polity, as Simon Martin uh, lead, laid out in great detail in his recent book on the topic. And so in this context of political fragmentation, we still remain pretty ignorant of how this culture that we call classic Maya culture really developed and spread across the area. And this of course includes phenomena that have been lumped under the category of Maya religion. So I'm not going to solve that puzzle for everyone today. Uh, we'll just be looking at two different aspects of classic Maya religious culture. Uh, one of which are supernatural scribes. And the second is this phenomenon called why, uh, which in English translates to sleep, transform, or companion spirit. And these two case studies really mirror the fragmented but entangled nature of the classic Maya political landscape. And so they illustrate for us how cultural transmission among classic Maya elites really occurred alongside, but often out of sync with the political relations that their inscriptions and images so emphasized. And so together, these two cases of supernatural scribes and of why suggest that classic Maya religion developed collectively through regional interaction rather than through dissemination, just coming from one or two prominent cultural centers. And then more broadly beyond the, the Maya context, they suggest a model for potentially reconstructing cultural transmission in the ancient past. So we'll look at two case studies. We'll start with uh, supernatural scribes as the first one. And Mesoamerica is one of just four regions in the world that scholars agree on as places where writing was developed independently, meaning that writing was invented, uh, without prior knowledge of or exposure to another writing system. Uh, and the other three areas, of course, are Egypt, China, and Mesopotamia. And so there were a variety of different writing systems developed in Mesoamerica over the course of several hundred years. Uh, the classic Maya hieroglyphic writing is the most robust of these systems and also the one that has been best documented. And this is a writing system that was really dominated by classic Maya elites in terms of textual production and also of text use or consumption. At the same time in classic Maya conception, the writing system itself was not actually the Maya's own creation. Their right to it was borrowed rather than inherited. Um, as Michael Coe, an anthropologist pointed out several decades ago, the origins of the hieroglyphic script, like those of classic Mayas themselves, were rooted in a primordial past in which the earliest humans acquired this powerful system of graphic communication from otherworldly sources. And so, in essence, this was a technology that they were loaning from the supernatural realm. It wasn't an earthly invention. During the classic period, uh, we see a variety of representations of supernatural figures who appear as scribes. 
Uh, and the supernatural patron and sort of the most common of these supernatural figures of scribes was a spider monkey. Uh, and this is a outstandingly clever figure that Michael Coe first identified in imagery several decades ago. And this uh, supernatural patron, the spider monkey, is identical, especially by certain simian facial characteristics that he has. Uh, in some cases, the whole body of the supernatural scribe is represented as a monkey, as in this particular example. Uh, in other cases, it's more the face that indicates the uh, association with the supernatural patron, uh, but the body is itself much more anthropomorphic. And while the supernatural patron was really the most uh, sort of prominent of these supernatural scribes, these other than human scribal figures could really take on a lot of other forms as well. Uh, and like the Simeon patron, uh, many of these are also zoomorphic or animal characters. Uh, in many cases, they're specifically mammalian. Uh, we have a rabbit here, for example, and then a deer here holding a Maya book. Uh, but we, there are exceptions, of course. Uh, this is one of the notable ones showing a vulture, so of course an avian uh, supernatural scribe. In other cases, these supernatural scribes were shown as gods uh, or as being more anthropomorphic, so looking more like humans. Uh, but even these supernatural scribes that are more human-like still have obviously supernatural figures, uh, such as foliage sprouting from different body parts, or they have ears that are not typical of humans. In this case, they're actually uh, more like deer ears. And so all of these figures were thus sort of distinguished from your average human scribe. Unfortunately, most of the images of these other than human scribes that we have come from unprovenanced artifacts. So we can't actually do a really fine grained distributional analysis across time and space of where these images are from and who made them. The corpus does at least indicate that other than human scribes were most frequently depicted in the late classic period. Uh, so in the seventh, eighth and ninth centuries CE, uh, but even Despite the fact that we don't have archaeological context, we can look at the immediate context of these images themselves. So what the scribes are doing, where they're shown, uh, how they're engaging with their tools, who they're interacting with. And this kind of internal analysis gives us some insight into the cultural roles that these figures played, including the different values that classic Mayas attributed to the practice, the artifacts, and the actors of hieroglyphic writing in their culture. So for example, we can look at the context. Uh, so when other than human scribes are shown with a codex or book or some other text artifact, uh, like these two uh, monkey scribes shown here, they're often shown depicted or they're often depicted directly engaging with that artifact. Um, and that artifact is consistently either touching their body or within easy reach of them. So again, here we have two monkey scribes who are seated right up uh, against a book that is propped open in front of them. It's also interesting to note that these scribes often appear in mythological scenes or courtly scenes uh, that some of them are pretty busy. Uh, we saw this on the previous slide. Uh, and then on this one as well, there's a variety of characters moving around and engaging with each other in different ways. However, within these scenes, the other than human scribes tend to be kind of isolated. Uh, their uh, posture and their body language rarely suggest that they're directly interacting with other figures in that moment. And on occasions when an other than human scribe is shown engaging with a partner, that partner is consistently a fellow scribe or someone else who's using at least the same sort of book or writing artifact. And we can see an example of that here. This is a mythological scene. We have several gods and other figures over here sort of doing their thing. And then off to the side, we have these two uh, supernatural scribes perched up here who again are really only directly interacting with each other. Uh, this one of the back seems to have his hand placed on uh, the back of the monkey scribe in front of him who's holding a book. And then um, this one is holding a 
the ha open half of a conch shell that would have been used as an inkwell or paint well, uh, basically for dipping the brush into to write. So what can all these different images of other than human scribes, of which there are many more than I've shown here, um, what can they teach us about classic Maya scribal culture? And there's a couple of ideas that do come to the fore. Um, the first of these is perhaps the most obvious one, that uh, classic Maya scribes and scribal culture was primarily a male domain. All the images of other than human scribes that we have, as well as of generic human scribes, they're male presenting. And we don't know of any prohibitions against female involvement in hieroglyphic writing. And there is some slight evidence that women uh, functioned or acted as scribes at times. But again, the vast majority of the evidence points to scribal participation having been really monopolized by a, a small cohort of elite men, many of whom may have also played active roles in the important historical events that they were themselves recording. Another aspect to think about is social context. These depictions of other than human scribes, as I noted, uh, tend to show them as kind of set off from other actors. And that can be interpreted as so, sort of showing details from larger scenes or images that home in on the person and the practice of the scribe. But this motif also suggests that although the scribe was assumed to be a common presence in royal and even in mythological settings, settings, excuse me, uh, he was considered a, more of an observer or an accessory rather than an active participant in the events, at least in his capacity as a scribe. And perhaps it's for this reason that in the text that we do have, scribes are very rarely referenced as active participants in the historical events that they themselves were actually recording. And then the third point connects back to this idea mentioned at the onset of this uh, sort of mythological origin of hieroglyphic writing. And these supernatural scribes also themselves sort of embodied a reminder of the mythological associations of the script itself. And they reflected the esoteric knowledge that was entailed in making and reading hieroglyphs. Uh, and when I say esoteric here, I don't mean uh, archaic or marginal. I mean esoteric in the sense of that this knowledge was restricted and that access to it was privileged. It wasn't common to all members of classic Maya society. Because in the end, the script was itself fundamentally an other than human creation and humans were really using it as a cosmological privilege. So these other than human scribes shown in classic Maya imagery depicted a parallel ritual community whose portraits reminded viewers that the hieroglyphic technology's origins and significance really extended far beyond the scope of human experience. So that was the first case study of supernatural scribes. We'll now continue exploring this landscape of religious exchange through close examination of the second case study, uh, which as I mentioned, is this phenomenon known as why which is the classic Mayan term, the language of the hieroglyphs uh, that can be glossed in English as sleep transform or companion spirit. And as we'll see, it's diverse meanings really ranged. Uh, it sometimes referred to a Wayib, which was a place uh, associated with the gods and ancestors, literally a sleeping or dreaming place. Uh, why were also at times zoomorphic figures that have been interpreted as companion spirits or novels. Uh, or they were embodiments of disease and other threatening forces. So one of the reasons why, why is such a sort of fascinating phenomenon to study and also really important for understanding Mesoamerican religion more broadly is because of its relation to this idea of Nahualism. Um, and indeed, this why evidence that we'll be going through provides the oldest written, oldest hieroglyphic, and also the oldest uh, clearly marked iconographic evidence that we have for Nahualism in Mesoamerica, as David Stewart and Stephen House had pointed out several decades ago. So what is Nahualism then? Um, well, it's a broad indigenous Mesoamerican concept whose history stretches from the ancient past, likely uh, earlier than the classic Maya evidence that we have, well into the present. The term Nahual itself is usually represented with one of three different spellings that I've uh, put here up for you today. 
Uh, but Nahual is an originally a Nahuatl term that has been borrowed into Spanish and is often applied to Mesoamerican traditions outside of central Mexico. Uh, because again, as although Nahualism has a lot of local manifestations, it really is part of a larger regional uh, practice. So generally speaking, Nahuals are non-human or other than human entities. They often take on an animal form and they inhabit this liminal space between the human world and the realm of the gods and ancestors. Nahuals could take on different functions, powers or attributes depending on the local tradition in Mesoamerica and scholars have written books on this topic. So this is not the place to get into the details, uh, but just as a general overview, in many traditions, a person acquires one or more novels at birth, uh, and these companion spirits accompany that person throughout their life. They can have a positive, negative, or neutral influence on uh, humans, so they have a kind of ambiguous relationship uh, with people they're associated with. These novels can also be affected or manipulated by others, uh, particularly by healers and sorcerers to either help or harm someone. For instance, a healer can uh, work to cure or heal a Nahual that has been injured, uh, or a, a sorcerer or someone else who wants to do harm to anyone can, sort of in an extreme example, actually kill that person's Nahual, which typically results in the death of that person shortly thereafter. So again, importantly, the classic Maya case offers evidence of not only of Nahualism as a tradition, but also of just the diversity of the tradition in its local expression. Uh, and we, again, it offers uh, evidence of this already in the distant past. So in other words, it suggests that this concept, this phenomenon of Nahualism didn't just become fragmented or take on this um, more sort of diverse manifestation as a result of Spanish colonialism. This polyvalence or this state of multiple meaning was really part of its pre-colonial nature too. So again, returning to the classic Maya context at hand, Nahualism uh, is attested in the hieroglyphic records and in imagery from as early as the fifth century CE. And in classic Mayan, the language of the hieroglyphic uh, inscriptions, Nahuals are called Y or Y yeast, uh, which in English again means sleep or dream. And it references the Nahuals associations with nighttime and this sort of untethered world of dreams. So looking at the classic Maya evidence, we'll start off with the hieroglyphs and then move on to the images. So in almost all cases, the classic Mayan word Y was written using a logograph or a word or idea sign instead of being written phonetically using syllables. Uh, and the main logographs that we have uh, that were used to write Y that we know of to date are shown here on this slide. As you can probably see at first glance, uh, there is a lot of diversity, but there are, are patterns too. Some of these graphs, um, some of these signs are graphically related to or derived from each other. Um, sort of most obviously these jaguar heads, obviously based on the same uh, animal. This one just has this extra curl on top of it. And these two signs, similarly, this bottom one has an extra element above it that the top one doesn't. Uh, but if you look more closely, this element that's inside here is the same as the one in the jaguar. Uh, so again, some graphic uh, interrelations between some of these signs, but not, not all of them. So we have a lot of diversity, um, but these signs were not used equally and they also weren't distributed randomly in terms of the frequency or the function they served. So for instance, these two signs highlighted here in blue, we really only have one to two examples of them from the entire classic Maya corpus. So they're extremely rare and seem to have been local, almost one-offs, whereas these ones highlighted here in green, we have scores and examples of them. And uh, this one here at the center top in yellow in particular, this was just the most uh, common logograph for Y across the board in classic Maya writing, but it was especially common in using either writing the word Yib, a sleeping place, or Y in the sense of this companion spirit or Nahual. 
The glyph down on the lower left, in contrast, uh, was primarily used to write the month's name Yev. Uh, Yev was the last month in the classic Maya 265 or 365 day solar year. And it was this unlucky five day period at the end of the year that was a time of um, instability and transition and in some cases destruction prior to the renewal that came at the beginning of the year. So again, this hieroglyphic form for Y was primarily used in calendric context. And then we see in these four examples here, uh, they were all primarily used to write uh, this term Yis, which was a regional political title that was associated with a particular area of the classic Maya lowlands that we'll uh, see shortly. So this hieroglyphic diversity, we see that there's some differences in function or you know, what, these, what aspects of the Y phenomenon these signs are used to record. And it's really interesting to note too that this hieroglyphic diversity for Y is apparent from really early on. This is just a map showing uh, the classic Maya communities from which we have Y logographs from the fifth and sixth century CE, so relatively early. Uh, and they all come on dated stone monuments from these 10 different sites. Uh, and given the early period, these sites are pretty geographically dispersed. Um, and I say, given the early period, because in the fifth and sixth centuries, we just don't have that many uh, inscriptions in general compared to later during the seventh, eighth and ninth centuries where we just have a lot more data to work with. And so this distribution among 10 sites during this early period makes it really much more notable that we already see a lot of diversity in the logographs that scribes are using to write why. Again, we have 10 different sites and already just during this time period, we have four different logographs that were used between them. And the logographs also were pretty spread out geographically uh, with the exception of this particular form that is concentrated. Again, this is the form that was associated primarily with this regional political title of Wayis and concentrated more uh, in this area of what's now uh, Southern Campeche in Mexico and Northern Guatemala. Other than that, we don't see these logographs sort of clustering in particular sites and their neighbors. Uh, we also don't see in the inscriptions themselves a strict association of specific logographs with uh, specific meanings or functions. There are some tendencies that tend to crystallize over time, uh, but again, there's no hard and fast rule about what context Y is written in with what logograph. And so this evidence from the early centuries of Maya writing really shows the widespread circulation and cultural diversity of this phenomenon uh, from early on of the concept of why, but also of the hieroglyphs used to represent it. And the chronology is also relevant here. The first dated example we have from these 10 sites comes from the site of El Zapote in what's now Northern Guatemala uh, that dates to the year 426. And as I mentioned before, this glyph would eventually become the most common logograph for Y in classic Maya inscriptions overall. So maybe not surprising that it was the first one. The second and third examples though, in terms of chronology are two different logographs. Uh, so the second, again, coming from Tikal, a close neighbor of El Capote, also in what's now Northern Guatemala. And then farther Southwest, Altar de Sacrificios, we have a third logograph coming up already. And this pattern of dispersed adoptions continued uh, throughout this early period. And I've just marked the first eight here for reference. As I mentioned, there are of course gaps in the data from this early period, especially. Um, but as you can see here, the evidence suggests that there was really no single cultural center where this Y phenomenon developed. And this dispersion also suggests that the Y phenomena really spread more as a concept with multiple facets independently from how that concept was recorded, recorded hieroglyphically. So in other words, it doesn't seem like this was a case of scribes in their writing training. They learned a particular glyph and learned, okay, this sign means Y. It was probably more through spread of the concept, which included multiple different ways of representing it hieroglyphically. So as promised in the remaining minutes, we'll take a look at the uh, iconographic evidence, uh, uh, particularly of images of these Nahuals or companion spirits 
uh, in the form of Y. So in classic Maya imagery, uh, these Y appear often as animals, uh, turkeys or peccaries, for instance, toads or jaguars. A lot of them though are hybrid beings uh, that combine features from gods, uh, animals and or humans. This, uh, this turkey down here, for instance, looks fairly like your average turkey. Uh, this peccary next to it, however, is spouting fire through its nose. So hopefully something we wouldn't actually run into in the forest. And these Y figures as the upper scene especially demonstrates were often engaged in a variety of different events. Uh, a lot of these aren't really clear to us. Uh, many of them, however, are shown dancing or participating in sacrifices. Uh, and this skeleton here is a good example of that. Uh, so we have a skeletal figure uh, decorated with various um, dismembered eyeballs, different parts of his body. And then we also see that he is holding a human head from which blood is emanating. So clearly something related to sacrifice, but the context of these images, unfortunately doesn't provide a lot of clues into, in terms of what's going on. And similar to what we saw in the hieroglyphs, the roster of Y figures in these images is really diverse even from early on. Uh, the earliest images of why in the classic Maya area that we have are from ceramics associated with the site of El Zot in the central Maya lowlands. Uh, and these are two of the many vessels and they already show, as you can see here, a really wide range of why who combine zoomorphic, anthropomorphic and supernatural figures. Um, and so again, the diversity here in imagery is present really early on as we saw with the hieroglyphs. Unfortunately, as was the case with the supernatural scribes, a lot of these images of Y figures are on vessels that were looted. So we don't have an exact archaeological context from them. Uh, however, thanks to work done by archaeologists and art historians looking at um, stylistic comparisons and then also the advances of uh, decipherment of Maya hieroglyphs, we can connect some of these Y figures to specific classic Maya polities. And this is Maybe the most significant takeaway from looking at these Y images, at least for the purpose of this talk, um, and that's that when these Y characters are assigned a political title that identifies them with a specific polity, that polity isn't necessarily the same one where the vessel was being made or the images were being painted. In other words, artists weren't just representing the Y figures that belonged to their home community. In fact, they were often representing non-local Y figures. And this particular image, which is uh, presented to us in Justin Kerr's rollout format of a vase that actually is cylindrical, uh, this vessel provides a really nice example. Uh, scholars have identified it uh, based on epigraphic and stylistic features as probably having been made by artists at a site called Motul de San Jose near Lake Paten Itza in Northern Guatemala around the same areas Tikal and El Zapote and the maps we saw earlier. And the hieroglyphic captions on this vessel assign a political affiliation to at least eight different Y beings. Now, all of them can be linked to known archeological sites, hence the question marks. Uh, but it is notable here that none of these Y figures feature the same title that was used locally by uh, rulers at Motul de San Jose. So again, this locally produced vase was really reproducing a regional cohort of Y figures. The other notable feature is that, well, unfortunately, most Y figures are not identified with a political title, um, but when they were, artists were pretty consistent in associating specific figures with specific polities. For instance, uh, we have several images and different vessels of this sort of snake deer hybrid. You can see the deer here with a snake wrapped around its neck uh, and the hieroglyphic caption here as well as on other images indicates that this uh, Y figure was associated with the Khan polity that was based at Calakmul and Sibanche in the south of what's now the Mexican state of Campeche. Similarly, uh, we have a fiery Kawati with you know, fire coming out of the tail here uh, and this Y figure also appears in a variety of different images. 
having the title of the polity that was based at Tikal in the central Paten, uh, which we saw again a couple of slides previous. So this roster of Y characters was diverse, um, but many of these figures, both those with and without political associations, recur in the corpus and vessels that stylistically were probably produced in different uh, workshops and different areas. Because of this, we can see that these Y characters, again, were part of the shared cultural knowledge that was transmitted along with other knowledge of the Y phenomenon that included glyphs used to write them. There were different local expressions of the phenomena, but there was also a regional awareness uh, that it was part of a larger tradition and that there were certain aspects of that tradition that were shared. And one of the big factors or one of the big uh, important contexts in which some of this exchange might have played out probably actually included these images themselves. Um, and that's because these polychrome ceramics on which a lot of Y figures were painted were really widely gifted and traded among classic Maya elites. Um, and we know that circulation of these vessels showing different Y characters some of which were linked to particular political identities, probably reflected and perpetuated transmission of knowledge about the Y phenomenon. And this uh, image here, again, on another rollout uh, photograph of a vase uh, done by Justin Kerr, this doesn't show Y figures, it shows very human figures, and it's a scene of tribute presentation or gifting uh, of a variety of objects, but most notably for my purposes here, two ceramic vessels, one of which is this tripod plate and another here that is very much like the cylindrical vessel that the image is actually painted on. And so exchanging these vessels with Y representations and then also just the, the travel of people that would have been needed for these material exchanges would have authored other communities direct access to the images of different Y characters and their names and quality affiliations supplied in the captions. And this presumably would also have been supplemented by sort of verbal exchanges by the people who were interacting with these objects. Uh, and so this is just, again, one possible scenario for how this religious transmission occurred in really concrete material terms. Again, just to wrap things up, these cases of supernatural scribes and why suggest that classic Maya religion really developed collectively through regional interaction rather than uh, under the influence of one or two prominent cultural centers. And these cases also indicate that religious knowledge and practices were closely bound up in other facets of elite cultural and material expression, including hieroglyphic writing, calendrics, uh, politics, and trade. And again, more broadly, uh, they also offer a possible model or uh, way for reconstructing cultural transmission, religious transmission between communities in the ancient past you, by using distributional analysis, looking at diverse expressions of a sort of larger umbrella religious phenomenon. And again, I'd like to thank uh, very much Adela Pineda and Paloma Diaz for inviting me to give this talk uh, to the various people and institutions who have supported this work to date. And I'm looking forward to questions and comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Masumoto. If you can stop your power. Maybe. Here. Thank you so much. So uh, first I want to rem remind everyone to uh, post your questions on Facebook where you are watching us right now. Ustedes pueden publicar sus preguntas en español también, si eso prefieren, y las vamos a traducir. I also want to thank our colleagues at the Mesoamerica Center for helping us to promote this talk today. So while we are waiting for other questions, I have a couple for you. Uh, I was very intrigued in general about how sophisticated your research is, and I was wondering how much the field, uh, the field research for classic Mike studies has evolved in the last 10, 20 years, what new technologies, what new tools are coming that we didn't have before, and how much those tools are maybe reshaping findings, clarifying past misconceptions. But yeah, wow, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I'll, I guess I'll restrict my answer to sort of aspects of classic my research that are relevant to what I was directly talking about. Um, 
and certainly there have been the the field continues to grow and evolve as sort of new faces come in and new technologies are developed. Um, some of the ones that are relevant to the evidence I was talking here is um, three dimensional documentation, for instance, has been really helpful for making uh, images of artifacts uh, more widely accessible to particularly to researchers and others who aren't able to travel to places or, you know, for researchers who want to continue working with these objects, even if they're not physically in the laboratory. Uh, and also be able to manipulate them in ways that uh, without fear of damaging the actual object. So that's been uh, really important. Uh, there's a variety of other uh, more digital humanities oriented initiatives to make certain data sets or documentation forms publicly accessible, which again enables research on a different levels for a much wider community of people. Um, those are some of the ones that I can immediately think of. And then, of course, the, the question of archaeological context, not only are archaeologists continue, continuing to explore new sites, uh, but also explore, go back to old sites and ask different questions, but uh, there's also been work slowly over the years um, that has really helped contextualize objects that we know only really from looted artifacts, um, the work that other scholars um, Dory Rince um, and others have done in Brian, Brian Just as well um, with the vessels from the Motul de San Jose workshops, for instance. Uh, those that's been supported not only by stylistic analysis but also by, by uh, archaeological excavations in that site as well. So that combination of sort of more art historical conservation research with archaeological context. Um, has been really helpful in sort of uh, providing more context retrospectively to objects that were not extracted by archaeologists. Thank you, Mallory. We have a question from Professor David Stewart in the Department of Art and Art History. Great talk, Mallory. Any thoughts on the institutional aspects of how esoteric knowledge was transmitted among the different, often conflicted polis? To some degree, such knowledge was standardized or agreed upon, and I have long wondered how that was maintained. Yeah, um, I mean, this is at least for me the million-dollar question, uh, and something I'm certainly going to be working on for quite a while. Uh, so, I guess to to go to your point, we do have so that is at least to me one of the really fascinating parts about looking at the evidence this way is that we do see clear evidence of contact and exchange on a cultural level between polities that at least in their inscriptions are clearly do not like each other and are fighting frequently. Um, in terms of how that was maintained, I suspect that part of it was because these dynasts and members of their royal court and other you know, more elite members of classic Maya society who were creating these images, creating these hieroglyphic texts, they were really, despite the fact that they were politically sometimes at odds with each other, they were still very much aware of these larger cultural connections between them. That they shared a writing system, that they shared a calendar, that they shared certain gods. And so this exchange, my sense is that it was occurring in channels that were not, um, that it was more that politics was happening within this larger, uh, context of classic Maya cultural uh, interaction rather than the culture being confined to the channels that politics was defining, if that makes sense. That's at least my, my take on it. We'll see. Thank you. I'm sure David will continue this discussion with you after the event. We have other comments from people from Lorraine Sprackholder, awesome talk, Ash Cole, that was wonderful, Mallory, Pretty Brown, really fascinating work. Great talk, Dr. Masumoto. And, and Mallory, in case we have maybe prospective students or maybe faculty who would like to relocate to UT Austin, what can you tell us about UT Austin's strength to study Mesoamerican studies and particularly classical Maya? And also, can you tell me a little more about the Maya cluster of which you're part? 
Yeah, so um, yes, I arrived at UT Austin as part of this larger Maya cluster hire, um, which was initiate, initiated by faculty members here at UT and brought in four new faculty members, um, myself, ESL Kokti Ren, who's in anthropology, Amy Thompson and Tom Garrison, who are in geography. Um, and we just joined a, a very robust cohort of Maya scholars and Mesoamericanists who are already on campus. Um, and so in terms of the research strengths of UT, that certainly sort of makes UT really unique, uh, just that there's strength in, not only strength in numbers, but also just the diversity of things that people are doing. We have people who are uh, doing ethnographic work and modern communities today in Mesoamerica, people who are you know, looking back even earlier times and what I was talking about in this presentation, doing archeological work, and then sort of the whole spectrum in between uh, specialists in language, in landscape and spatial analysis, in ceramic analysis. Um, so just really depth and breadth uh, is sort of what makes UT unique in that respect, as well as the, the institutional support and just the, really robust tradition that UT has of not just Mesoamerican studies, but also Latin American studies generally. So it's because of that reputation, because uh, it's already such a point of pride for UT, it tends to draw scholars and faculty members and graduate students uh, who are interested in these topics in this area of the world. And then in undergrads, it, it, there's just a lot more opportunities to take classes with faculty that can you know, inspire them either to continue studying that or at least let them you know, go out into the world after graduation with uh, more awareness and knowledge of the region and its cultures. Great. We, we are really excited about this new Maya cluster, how it's bringing new voices to campus. And we hope we can recruit grad students who want to study these issues. We don't have our questions. We are really excited to introduce you to our community of Latin Americanists. And once again, Welcome, Dr. Matsumoto. Yes, thank you again. Bye.